Okay, we are live, all sergeants. At this time, will you please start your recordings? Recording to the computer, all set. Thank you. All recording, rolling. Thank you. Backup is rolling. Thank you, Sergeant Sadowski. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, we are ready to begin. Chair Lewis, whenever you're ready. Hope you guys can hear that. Good morning, everyone. I'm Council Member Farrah Lewis, Chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction. And I'd like to thank everyone who is joining us today for this remote hearing. I would also like to welcome members of the committee and council members who are present. I see currently Council Members Riley, Cabrera and Borelli. This morning, we are holding an oversight hearing entitled Access to Mental Health Care in Communities of Color. In New York City today, in the year 2021, more than a year into a public health crisis that has worsened the mental health of nearly every person in this city, it is extremely difficult to find affordable, comprehensive, immediately immediate, and culturally competent and accessible mental health care if you are a person of color. So I'll reiterate. If you are a Black, Brown, Asian, or another New Yorker of color, you are more likely to find yourself living in a mental health care desert, a mental health care desert or mental health care professional shortage area is a community where residents who need mental health services outnumber the providers who are available to serve them. For example, in the Bronx, 91% of residents insured by Medicaid most of whom are black, brown, and low income, live in a mental health desert. Even for those that do not live in a mental health desert, communities of color in New York City are also far more likely to be under and uninsured than white communities, which automatically decreases access to affordable mental health care service. This is because mental health providers do not accept insurance at all. And although 90% accept private insurance, only 71% of providers accept Medicaid and 85% accept Medicare. And even for New Yorkers of color with insurance that live in a community with mental health providers, it is difficult to find mental health providers with language skills, cultural sensitivity who represent the diverse populations of New York City. According to the American Psychological Association in 2018, about 86% of psychologists in the United States workforce who were white or fewer than 15% were from other racial and ethnic groups. So I'll repeat what I said before. If you are a person of color in New York City, it is extremely difficult to find affordable, comprehensive, immediate, culturally competent and accessible mental health care. This issue is not new. It is extremely complex and not easy to solve. This is a problem that has been created by generations of federal, state, and city negligence of our communities. To start, Medicaid pays rates that dis disincentivize even the most well-meaning providers. According to a Medicaid to Medicare fee index, which measures each state's physicians' fees relative to Medicare fees. In 2016, New Yorkers with, um, in a Medicaid program pay physicians' fees at 56% of Medicare rates. More specifically, New York's Medicaid program paid primary care physicians at 44% of Medicare rates. That is definitely unacceptable. 
Further, the shift from fee for service to managed care has left too many community-based organizations unable to cover their expenses, unable to receive reimbursements for their services, and unable to negotiate livable wages for their practices. That also is very unacceptable. Additionally, insurance networks for mental health providers are far too small. A 2015 survey found that people were far less likely to find or use an in-network mental health provider compared to other types of medical specialists. And finally, and perhaps more disturbingly, mental health parity, meaning that health insurers apply similar processes and restrictions for treatment and coverage of mental health and substance use disorders as they would for medical and surgical benefits. It has never been fully realized here in New York. Leaving providers with low reimbursement rates and very difficult survey of state efforts to ensure parity when it comes to behavioral health insurance benefits. New York City has received a failing grade on this. So what are we gonna do about it? And what are we gonna to do to ensure livable wages for mental health providers? What are we gonna to do to advocate at the state and federal level to correct these problems? What are we doing to allow access to the next generation of New Yorkers of color to educational opportunities, mental health trainings and graduate degrees? What are we doing to address stigma that may prevent New Yorkers in our most vulnerable communities from accessing care? And what are we doing to address the existing gaps in care throughout New York City? So I'll go on to share some sobering statistics. In 2017, 76% of US born Asian American Pacific Islander New Yorkers with depression reported that they were at a time in the past, in the last 12 months when they needed treatment for mental health problems but did not get it nationally. Black adults are 10% more likely to report serious psychological distress than white adults. Latinx New Yorkers display higher rates of depression than white New Yorkers, but white New Yorkers suffering from depression are more likely to engage in treatment. We cannot wait to fix this problem. The time to address this is right now. At today's hearing, the committee looks forward to hearing from the administration, our community-based organizations, and advocates about how New York City can address this issue head on. And finally, ensure accessible, affordable, comprehensive, and culturally sensitive mental health care to communities of color. I want to thank the administration, DOHMH, Thrive, Health and Hospitals, who are here with us today. I know you are committed to working on this issue for all New Yorkers and to effectively address the mental health needs that arise in our communities. I look forward to hearing from you all today and to learn more about the role that the City Council can play in supporting your efforts. I also wanna thank my colleagues as well as the committee staff, Senior Counsel Sarah Liss, Legislative Policy Analyst Christy Dwyer, Finance Analyst Lauren Hunt, and Legislative Intern Stefan Aspromonte for making this hearing possible. I now turn to Public Advocate Jermani Williams, who is with us today, to share remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Lewis. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, my name is Jermani Williams. I'm the Public Advocate for the City of New York. I again want to thank Chair Lewis for holding this very important hearing today and for giving me an opportunity to speak. Uh, we know that mental health affects us all. And I want to make sure I make that clear. And uh, I want to also uh, lift up Deputy Inspector Dennis Mullaney, who took his life yesterday, uh, showing that this mental health uh, is very real across all lines. Uh, even though, and I pray for his family, his friends. Uh, even with that being true, it is right uh, to hold a hearing on the impacts of mental health in the black and brown and people of color community. Uh, we've seen from infe infection to injection uh, how much more these communities are affected, and that includes mental health, and that includes sometimes trying to self-medicate to deal with the pain. I have been very open uh, about my own uh, mental health and yeah. uh, the services I've received in therapy for at least the past five years and the impact that that's had on me 
and being able to finally have a, a long, strong, healthy uh, relationship. And I can't imagine uh, trying to go through the times that we're going now without having access to those services. And I'm saddened for those who do not. I am not okay. Those words resonated with a lot of folks last year when I first said them. They understood that what was happening then was just too much. In communities of more color, many people still feel that way. It is too much when a family member or friend passes away from a virus again and again. It's too much when people watch videos of death. These feelings are real and there is need to be a space for us to talk about how we are feeling when overwhelmed. I have still not looked at the video of George Floyd. I can only take a few minutes at a time on CNN when they speak of what's happening in the courtroom. When I said those four words last year, I meant them. The raw emotion exists in communities of more color. At the same time, there can be a stigma when discussing how to manage those emotions. Asking for help too often can be seen as weakness. We need to make sure that there is courage and strength to ask a person for help. People do not need to suffer. When you are not okay, we need to make sure someone is there to help. And as the chair mentioned, even unfortunately, if you have gotten the courage and strength to reach out, you sadly may not have the resources to access the help that's needed. That's why the upcoming budget negotiations are important. And why I keep pointing out, we have to send a better message of how we're trying to keep people safe and healthy. While the NYPD's budget will be slightly increasing the Department of Health and Mental Health Hygiene's budget is going in the wrong direction. Mental health cannot be just seen again as a simple policing issue. It's not a simple issue at all, but we know we can't fix it by decreasing the agencies that are mandated to try to prevent, to try to provide the services that are needed. We do not simply just need more money for NYPD. We need more money for all of these agencies. We need actual investment for communities of more color that is designed to address, not perpetrate trauma. Frankly, communities of more color have struggled with mental health at disproportionate rates. For example, nationally, black individuals are 20% more likely than others to experience serious mental health problems, according to the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health. The pandemic has only amplified mental health issues. A New York State Health Foundation report found that 42% of Latinx and 39% of Black New Yorkers reported anxiety or depressive symptoms in October 2020. Clearly, it is difficult for people of more color to deal with the constant threat of virus, lack of stable job opportunities, rising costs, and so many other concerns. We should also be mindful of the number of mental health facilities, as the chair mentioned, in proximity to communities of more color. There are hundreds of mental health facilities across the city, with the most found in Manhattan. Notably, there are some neighborhoods in the city, such as in Southeast Queens or Northwest Bronx, without a nearby mental health facility at all. That highlights the challenge of accessibility to mental health facilities for so many in New York City. This is the right opportunity to propose solutions. Early last month, my office released a report titled A Renewed Deal for New York City that highlights some solutions that the administration should explore. The upcoming budget should ensure $7 million for two new respite centers and $20 million for four new support and connection centers. The latest federal stimulus should help fund this small ask. Finally, we cannot forget about the young people who are all struggling during the pandemic. The budget needs to account for more counselors and mental health staff in schools, not simply, again, additional funding for NYPD. Universal mental health screening is also needed, especially for students affected by the pandemic. We need to lift up our youth who have been historically marginalized and the budget must reflect that. I appreciate today's hearing as mental health can still act as a stigma for far too many in communities of more color, communities who need the assistance the most. Genuine investment is needed to make sure we can reduce the stigma and offer help to people of more color who need it. I thank the chair for allowing me to speak. I look forward to today's testimony. And as we redefine what public safety is and what public health is, uh, I hope uh, our dollars show it where our priorities are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Public Advocate Williams, for joining us today and for your remarks. I also want to share that we've been joined by Council Member Ayala and Council Member Amprey Samuels. I will now turn to Committee Council Sarah List to go over some procedural matters for this hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Lewis, and good morning, everyone. I am Sarah List, Counsel to the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction for the New York City Council. I'll be moderating today's hearing. 
Before we begin, I wanted to go over a couple of procedural matters. I will be calling on panelists to testify. I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify. You will then be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name to be called. For everyone testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted, and we thank you in advance for your patience. At today's hearing, the first panel will be the administration, followed by council member questions, and then the public will testify. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in order. I will now call on members of the administration to testify, and that will include both members who are testifying and those who will be answering questions. Dr. Myla Harrison, Acting Executive Deputy Commissioner, Division of Mental Hygiene, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Susan Herman, Director, Office of Thrive NYC. Dr. Charles Barron, Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Office of Behavioral Health for New York City Health and Hospitals. I will first read the oath and after I will call on each panelist individually to, re to respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Deputy Commissioner Dr. Harrison. Yes, I do. Thank you. Director Herman. I do. I do. Thank you. Dr. Barron. Yes, I do. Thank you. Dr. Harrison, you can begin when you're ready. Thank you so much. Good morning, Chair Lewis and members of the committee. I'm Dr. Myla Harrison, Acting Executive Deputy Commissioner of the Division of Mental Hygiene at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene Health Department. I am joined today by Susan Herman, Director of the Mayor's Office of Thrive NYC, and Dr. Charles Barron, Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Office of Behavioral Health at New York City Health and Hospitals. On behalf of Health Commissioner, Dr. Dave Choksi, Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the city's efforts to respond to the mental health needs of New York City's communities of color. The health department is committed to supporting the mental health and well being of all New Yorkers, and particularly New Yorkers that are experiencing disproportionate health, mental health, and social burdens. This includes people of color who, in many cases, experience physical health and mental health inequities. Differences in mental health outcomes among racial and ethnic groups are rooted in structural racism and other social determinants of mental health, not biological or individual traits. Social determinants of mental health, the conditions of the environment where people live, learn, work, and play, such as housing, education, income, income and wealth, among others, correlate greatly to individuals and communities' mental health and well being. For example, our 2017 Social Determinants of Health Survey found that serious psychological stress is higher among New Yorkers who experience financial struggles, who feel unsafe in their neighborhood, or who experience challenges with their home and living environment. These survey findings help illuminate how structural racism and our country's history of discriminatory policies profoundly influence the resources, opportunities, and experiences of people and communities of color in New York City. Our 2017 survey also found serious psychological distress was three times higher among adult New Yorkers who reported experiencing racism or discrimination a lot or some of the time compared to people who experienced racism a little or not at all. These findings underscore the importance of applying an equity approach to our work and directing resources to communities experiencing mental health disparities and inequities. I'd like to touch for a moment on how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting the mental health and well-being of New Yorkers, an area where again people of color are experiencing disproportionate health and social burdens. People of color particularly Black and Latino New Yorkers, have experienced a higher burden of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths from the COVID-19 pandemic compared to white New Yorkers. April and May 2020, New York City health opinion polls also indicate that factors that place adults at risk for adverse health 
Adverse mental health vary across race and ethnicity. These surveys indicate Latino and Asian adults are more likely than white adults to report a job loss or reduced hours, and Latino adults are more likely than white adults to report feelings of financial distress as a result of the pandemic. The health department addresses mental health needs and social determinants of mental health by collecting and monitoring mental health data, working with contracted providers to direct and deliver their services to individuals and communities with the greatest need and that experience mental health inequities, and by investing in services that close gaps in care or address mental health disparities. I will now share some highlights of our work that connects people of color to behavioral health services and increases their access to preventive care. To meet New Yorkers where they live and choose to receive services, we manage mobile treatment programs that provide mental health and substance use treatment and support people with serious mental health concerns, complex life situations, transient living situations, and or involvement with the criminal legal system. We also control access to 75 mobile treatment teams serving New York City for more than 4,600 treatment slots through a single point of access. Single point of access, SPOA, receives referrals, determines eligibility, and assigns individuals with serious mental illness to the appropriate provider. Mobile crisis teams are an effective and important tool to keeping New Yorkers connected to care over time. We operate health engagement and assessment teams, HEAT, which support individuals in the community presenting with a behavioral health challenge or health concern impacting their daily functioning. HEAT aims to help individuals remain connected to communities, connect them to care and services at critical moments in time. HEAT focuses on reducing racial inequities and receiving referrals from the community and local police precincts to encourage a health response and prevent criminal legal involvement as black New Yorkers disproportionately bear the burden of criminal legal system involvement in New York City. <clears throat> the health department addresses social determinants of mental health through one of our largest programs, supportive housing. We contract to provide more than 9,000 units of permanent supportive housing for people with serious mental illness, substance use disorders, and young adults. Supportive housing helps engage New Yorkers with services specific to their health and mental health care needs and provides stable housing for people who have been homeless. The health department also supports communities by helping individuals build resilience. As part of our COVID-19 response, the health department redirected our existing mental health first aid efforts to launch COVID-19 Community Conversations Program, 3C, which provides community training and discussions in English, Spanish, and Mandarin about the mental health impact of the pandemic, structural racism, coping and resiliency skills, and informs residents of available mental health resources. To date, more than 15,000 New Yorkers from the 33 priority neighborhoods identified that by the Mayor's Task Force on Racial Inclusion and Equity have taken this workshop. Our Brooklyn Rapid Assessment and Response provides trauma support to communities in Brownsville and Bedford-Stuyvesant, neighborhoods that are disproportionately affected by health inequities. The individuals living in those neighborhoods may have increased risk of mental health challenges and of premature mortality. This program seeks to increase the neighborhood's capacity to plan, prepare, and respond to traumatic incidents to mitigate the negative effects of trauma on individuals and community and increase community resilience. Brooklyn Rapid Assessment and Response provides virtual psychoeducation sessions, healing circles, and ongoing mental health training and support to local community-based organizations, providers, and advocates. Lastly, the Health Department's Neighborhood Health Action Centers in Brownsville, East Harlem, and Tremont provide a variety of resources and programs to serve residents' health needs. Action centers are located in neighborhoods burdened with the health inequities driven by decades of, I should say, centuries of disinvestment. The action centers bring together health care providers, government resources, and community-based organizations and programs under one roof. Community members can go to an action center for primary care and mental health care or referrals to healthcare services in their area. These are just a few highlights 
of our many initiatives and strategies to address gaps in care and social determinants of mental health to improve mental health and well being across New York City, particularly in communities of color and communities experiencing mental health inequities. In addition to this work, the health department provides all messaging and guidance in the languages spoken by the communities we serve. The health department keeps a standard of translating all materials into 13 languages and our COVID-19 related messaging has been translated in, translated in up to 26 languages. We rely on the feedback of our partners in the city council and members of the community like those here to testify today. I wanna thank you for your continued partnership feedback and support as we continue to care for the health of New Yorkers during this critical time in the city's history. I am happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. We now turn back to Chair Lewis to start off with questions. Thank you so much. So as you all are aware, accessible and equitable mental health care and services in communities of color have been historically problematic and even deplorable. So I wanted to provide some context for all of those that are joining us today and do a deep dive uh, regarding mental health deserts. So my first question to the administration would be, what are the mental health deserts in New York City share what neighborhoods have the least access to mental health resources? Thank you so much for that question. Um, I'm gonna start it off um, and uh, I may turn this over um, to my colleague from Thrive as well. Um, as you pointed to already, there are differences in mental health outcomes among racial and ethnic groups. And you know, some of those outcomes are really due to structural racism and other social determinants of health and are not individual traits or biological traits of, of people. And um, those social determinants of health as we've been talking about um, are conditions of the environment where people live, learn, work, and play, and include, as I mentioned earlier, housing, education, income, and wealth, and really greatly contribute to um, some of the disparities that, that we're faced with at this point. Um, I also wanna point out that in part through this pandemic, we have, um, have learned to take advantage of virtual care in a way that we uh, didn't, were not able to do before. And so it is not just dependent on having um, care in your community any longer. You can get care from any setting in part if you've got the technology and resources, telehealth and telemental health were turned on a dime in the in spring last year in a way that we never thought were imaginable. And that means that uh, care is available to people even if it is not around the corner from them. And it could be across the city where they are then able to access care. I also want to point out that a lot of the care for people um, in New York City with serious mental illness is available through mobile treatment services. And so those are uh, mobile treatment teams such as assertive community treatment teams and, um, and uh, IMT teams um, where the service can come to the individual where they live. And it is not dependent on having a bricks and mortar a solution uh, for them necessarily in their neighborhood because the service comes to them. The care is coming to them in a, in a mobile way. Well, Dr. Harrison, I thank you for sharing that. I understand what you mean, but for those that don't have access to digital devices, it further exacerbates the disparity. And I think what we're looking for is for access to that information that folks in all communities can receive so that they're aware of mobile treatment sites um, and other ways to get the treatment. So I do appreciate that information and maybe we can work on a way to share information about mobile treatment um, opportunities for our communities because I think that may be another solution to this issue. But I wanted to know if anybody could share specifically which neighborhoods have the least access of mental health resources, if we could name those neighborhoods um, as we further this conversation. So um, 
I don't have that, that list in, in front of me, but I think I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague in Thrive, Susan Herman, who um, can speak to some of the, the work that Thrive has been doing in this effort. All right, thank you. Thank you, Marla, and thank you, Chair Lewis. Um, thank you for having this hearing today. What I can say is we're, we'd be happy to provide maps for you of both the 17 federally designated mental health shortage areas and the 33 communities that were hardest hit by COVID. And they, they overlap in great um, part. Um, we, as, as you and I have, have talked about at Thrive, we have tried to place any of our services that are not mobile, services that are in a brick and mortar clinic, in a school, in a shelter, within areas that need the resources the most. So over 75% of Thrive resources are within these federally designated mental health shortage areas. And if you look at the 33 communities that the health department has designated, first of all, about half of New Yorkers live in those communities. And let's, let's just talk about some of the work that Thrive does there. 76% of our mental health service course sites are in these 33 communities. Um, we are currently supporting about 430 plus schools in those communities, but that number is growing all the time as we do more and more work with schools in those communities. And that includes on-site mental health services and high need schools. It includes the work of the school response clinicians, the mental health specialists and Pathways to Care, which is a new program, a partnership with health and hospitals to provide expedited referrals to assessment and treatment from schools to H&H &H child and adolescent clinics. Um, our support and connection centers are both in and will serve neighborhoods that are within these communities. Our social and emotional supports for parents and teachers over 80% of those sites are located in these 33 communities. So I could go program by program, but we are intentionally placing our programs within communities that need the resources the most. So thank you so much, um, Executive Director Herman. Um, I, I just have to push back a little bit only because We've been having this conversation, not you and I, but just in general. Um, we've been in this pandemic for a very long time. The fact that we don't have these 33 neighborhoods for this conversation today um, is, is definitely problematic. Um, so we need that information. We need to share it. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. The fact that we don't have the names of the neighborhoods, is that what you're saying? The we, 33 communities? It's about 33 neighborhoods. The reason why I want to share it is of because- course. Yeah. We can share that, and I believe it's up. I believe it's on the health department's website what the 33 neighborhoods are. Right. So we want it. We want it to be shared today at the hearing. Although it's on the website, it's important for us to share this conversation so that the public could hear and understand what's happening because they may not know it's on the website. We could say it's on the website, but they need to audibly hear this information today because um, that's definitely problematic that we don't have that. I want us to answer these questions as succinct as possible so that the information is shared today. So although you say it's on the website, uh, we'll get that information from your team or maybe my team could look for it since it's on the website, but it's important for us to have this information readily available for the community. So I'll just jump into the next question. I wanted to know how your agencies are continuously evaluating and analyzing access to mental health resources across the city um, by zip code. I'm, I heard Dr. Harrison mention earlier regarding data. So I just wanted to know how you're taking that data, evaluating and analyzing that information. Uh, please just bear with us a minute while we work to unmute Dr. Harrison. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry about the, that technology problem. Um, so I, I think um, you're asking about specifically zip codes and where do we 
where and how do we collect that information? I think, is, and I got distracted by not being able to unmute. So apologies on that. Um, so yes, there's a, there's um, a number of things that we do at the health department in terms of um, looking at where services are and where services um, should be. Some of that is through the kinds of data that we collect from community health surveys, which you um, refer to in your opening remarks. Um, uh, that's one way we collect information about um, where people um, of concern might be. We have to combine across years to get at um, anything close to communities because of the number of people that you need to be able to say that with, with uh, confidence. Um, we also have um, targeted our most recent programs. I was talking about the community conversations around COVID. 3C, those are targeted in the um, neighborhoods that most um, are most have been most impacted by, by COVID and most impacted by social determinants and longstanding disparities um, and racism. And as I mentioned, all 33 of the um, task forces, the mayor's task force on racial inclusion and equity neighborhoods have been touched by those, um, those sessions. And we track for those sessions where the people are coming from and what neighborhoods that they're in. So again, it depends on the program, um, how much information we have about communities of codes or neighborhoods that, that people are from. Where is that information being stored or shared? So the information on 3C specifically um, is being used to make sure that programmatically we are tapping into the right neighborhoods. And um, I don't know that it's publicly you know, available, but I'd be happy to follow up with you um, specifically about that program, for instance. I've also spoken um, in another hearing about community, uh, the, the community um, summaries that we've done at the health department that do look at uh, community health profiles and look at them community by community where um, there have been impacts of, actually it's not just mental health, it's health and mental health. It's the whole spectrum of uh, you know, care that, that uh, we're, we're um, concerned about. All right, thank you. So if, if you can share with us, what, what is your agency or the city in general doing to increase cultural competence, competency among mental health providers, including those in H&H &H facilities? So yeah, thank you for that question. I, um, you know, as I mentioned, and it's not the same as cultural competency, but I mentioned linguistic translations, language translations of the materials that we put out. Um, I think what I will do is turn this question, since you asked specifically about health and hospitals, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Dr. Barron to speak about the health and hospitals. Um, perspective on this. So thank you for that question. Um, uh, as you know, health hospitals have a number of uh, facilities across all the entire city. Um, yours, uh, with our acute care and our acute care. Uh, we represent uh, many communities of color throughout the city, uh, and we are there to say we have for everyone, uh, especially those of uh, color and uh, suffering from various social determinants of health. Uh, we try uh, to reflect our. Uh, Deputy Chief Sharon, it's a bit difficult to hear you. I don't know if anybody else is have is hearing. Okay. This is our new normal. So maybe you want to like adjust uh, the computer or the phone. I'm not sure what the mic is. Uh, to the communities. Uh, we have programs uh, 
Deputy Chief Barron, you're coming in very choppy. You might need to relocate your computer. Move it around a little bit towards the uh, internet, towards the Wi Fi. Uh, okay, while we work out these technical issues, why don't we turn back to Dr. Harrison um, and then we can move on to the next question if we're, if we're ready. Um, so th I'm, I'm not, thank you. I'm not gonna be able to respond for health and hospitals, but I'm sure that we'll figure out a way to get um, their response back to you. And I, I apologize I, on their thank behalf. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Thank you. So I was able to get the 33 neighborhoods. Um, so this is the neighborhoods, everyone. Lower East Side and Chinatown, Morningside Heights and Hamilton Heights, Central Harlem, East Harlem, Washington Heights and Inwood, Mott Haven and Melrose, Hunt Point and Longwood, uh, High Bridge and Concourse, Fordham and University Heights, Belmont and East Tremont, Kingsbridge, Park Chester, Williams, Bridge, Bedford, Stuyvesant, Bushwick, East New York, Starrett City, Sunset Park, Coney Island, Flatbush, Midwood, Brownsville, East Flatbush, Flatlands, Canarsie, Jackson Heights, Elmhurst, Kew Gardens, Queens Village, Rock. This is just to name a few. So, what criteria are used to determine what constitutes these particular communities as a mental health desert? I will tell you what I know about how these communities were chosen. These communities um, were not chosen specifically from a mental health desert perspective. They were chosen because of high rates of COVID uh, impact, illness, um, in addition to other longstanding social determinants that also then impact um, morbidity and mortality. And those other social determinants included poverty, unemployment, um, those sorts of factors. So it was a combination of health factors and social determinants that went into naming uh, those communities um, for New York City. And there are a lot of them, as you've, you, you've started to, to name. 33 is a lot of communities. It's definitely a lot. Um, and while COVID is a factor in this and part of the criteria is definitely um, some accessibility to mental health services needed here as well. This is even before the pandemic. Um, so I'll just jump to the next question before uh, we open up for our colleagues. And just wanna mention that Council Member Van Bramer has joined us as well. Uh, quick question, in a national survey of state efforts to ensure parity when it comes to be behavioral health insurance benefits, uh, New York received a failing grade. So what, what are your agencies doing to better ensure true parity for mental health benefits? Thank you so much for that question. We are very concerned about mental health parity, behavioral health parity, as you mentioned in your opening statements as well. Um, you know, we are strong advocates for individuals having the same access and reimbursement for mental health care as other um, health, physical health care. We've got um, uh, groups that advise us and that um, include community service boards within the health department and our regional planning consortium that are comprised of um, providers, um, individuals with lived experience um, and others. And they also advocate with us on these sorts of issues. And um, this is a larger issue. It you know, does point to, as you mentioned earlier, state and federal issues as well. And we'd be happy to um, team up with you or anyone um, from, from city council on, on these sorts of issues going forward. Happy to have follow up on that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I just wanted to know really quickly, is this advocacy work that your agencies are depending on from the community or is the city undertaking this on an, on an advocacy level? Um, I think I have to get back to you exactly on how you're framing that question. I'm not sure I have um, a, a clear response to that. I mean, we, we are advised by um, the community service board, for instance, and they are advising us as the health department. Um, and then if we take up their advice, then it's the city taking up their advice. So I think it's probably some of both, but I'm happy to, um, to, to talk more about exactly how, what you mean by that question. 
just spearheaded efforts by the city. I'm trying to see if this is spearheaded by the city of New York or if this is depending on agencies, but um, organizations, but you definitely give back to me. Just wanted to share, we were uh, joined by council member Rosenthal. I am going to yield back to committee council, Sarah Liss. Thank you very much, Chair. And I just like to remind uh, all the council members that if they have any questions, they could use the Zoom raise hand function at this time. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions at this time. So Chair, we could turn back to you to continue if you'd like. How surprising. Okay, so my next question, um, or the panel, depending upon the community, a need for mental health treatment can be very stigmatizing, um, as you all already know. So what is the city doing to reduce stigma across different communities? Thank you for that question. And you know, we did hear about this as well from um, our public advocate. I, I, I agree that um, stigma can be um, quite concerning um, in, as a way to impede people from getting care. And again, one of the things that we've been able to um, take advantage of in this unfortunately unfortunate time of a pandemic is um, pointing to the, the need for mental health supports and resilience in the context of the trauma of a pandemic. And that is one way um, to bring messages to communities where there might otherwise um, be stigma uh, around mental illness. It really does normalize um, the, the need for support and for self-care and for um, resiliency building. And I, I wanna say, you give me the opportunity to, to, to remind us that although people are um, experiencing stress and anxiety and depression in the context of this horrific pandemic, um, for the most, for most people, even though there is trauma and loss and grief, um, most people will be resilient. And we need to work towards um, helping folks uh, know that um, and work towards coping and work towards the things that are within their control to maintain uh, resilience within our societies and communities. Um, and so again, working at levels of the community is one way um, for us to do that. Some of our community conversations, 3C is one way to do that. Um, we have uh, Project HOPE, which is a federally funded um, program that comes to us in the city through the state uh, that offers a crisis counseling and coping and support uh, for individuals as well. And we're working with 21 community organizations throughout the city um, to get those services um, and supports out to people virtually at this point in time. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Um, so historically, there has been a real lack of financial support for Asian American and Pacific Islanders, uh, mental health care providers for the Asian community, um, especially during recent events and uptick in hate crimes. What is the city doing to ensure that the AAPI communities have what they need in the way of a demand on behavioral health services? Again, thank you um, for that question um, as well. We've taken on many initiatives to support the AAPI community, and we've continued to promote um, the mental health services that are available to New Yorkers, including information about NYC Well, the crisis call, text, and chat line that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week for anybody who is either in crisis, emotional, um, or is looking for information and referral um, to other services. And those NYC Well is available um, in Chinese language dialects as well for people and is also translated into more than 200 languages. I think I'm also going to um, ask Susan Herman to speak about some of the Thrive related initiatives um, that, that they're engaging in as well. Thank you. Uh, I think you know that we have a 
open solicitation out called Communities Thrive. And in the procurement process, uh, it's very difficult for me to talk about it when it's open and people are in the midst of applying. But what I can say is that we have an RFP out for something called Communities Thrive. It's a demonstration project that will involve um, anchor organizations from the AAPI community, the Black community, and the Latinx community. They will work with local community-based organizations and primary care providers who um, they bring into the partnership. And through that, we hope to not only launch um, culturally responsive public awareness campaigns that are guided by and initiated by these anchor organizations, but also to serve many people through telemental health. Our partner is Health and Hospitals. During the pandemic, they've provided about 200,000 telemental health um, sessions in addition to the 1 million, I guess 1 million total telehealth and 200,000 of those are telemental health sessions that they've provided. So they've become quite expert in doing this. They are our partner in this initiative. And we believe generally, it's not just communities thrive, but generally we believe that if people can get either mental health treatment or mental health support that will change the interaction between uh, a social service provider, say, or a teacher or a guidance counselor and a client or a student, that that interaction will go better. And if people can refer them to services when appropriate, that's helpful. So for instance, in our Connection to Care program, which was a five-year demonstration project, we worked with 14 community-based organizations, some of which serve the API community. They helped 46,000 individuals over that period of time. And what we know, these are social service agencies where people are going for other reasons. They're going for housing, they're going for employment counseling, they're going for legal services, range of social services. While there, if they have a mental health challenge that has been identified by a staff person who's been trained to do that, not only does that interaction go better, but a mental health partner that they're working with is easily accessible and people can be and were and are referred to treatment. So we believe that there are a number of ways of serving communities of color. And one way of doing it is by working through trusted members of their community, both local community-based organizations, faith leaders, places of employment. We have launched dozens of webinars to train nonprofit employers and corporate employers how to create and promote a more positive work environment that promotes mental health. We have worked and are continuing to work with faith leaders across the city so that as people, as the people many of us turn to for solace and comfort, when they know that someone is facing difficult times, hard times have fallen on them, they are better trained to recognize trauma and to know how to respond appropriately. So we are, in many ways, we're working with the people community members already trust to help get community members to the appropriate care at the right time. That's why we're in shelters, that's why we're in schools, that's why we're in social service agencies, that's why we partner with faith leaders. Thank you, Executive Director Harmon. So if we could just um, do a quick little deep dive and share some more information um, about Communities Thrive. I know that both Thrive NYC and Communities Thrive both attempt to bring mental health resources to vulnerable communities, particularly communities of color. So how do both um, initiatives differ? Uh, Thrive NYC is a citywide commitment to help people who need help get the help they need and to try and make sure that fewer needs turn into crises. We work with 13 city agencies and right now we have about 30 programs that are designed to fill gaps in care 
across the city, definitely with a lens of equity to try and make sure that people who live in historically underserved communities get the help they need, populations that are typically not well served get the help they need. So that's Thrive, that's the umbrella of all the work that we do. Communities Thrive is a program or an initiative that we will launch within that umbrella. And typically we partner with agencies. We also work with nearly 200 community-based organizations to do our work. Communities Thrive will be one of those programs within the Thrive NYC umbrella. And how many individuals will Communities Thrive intend to serve? Well, we're looking forward to reading the proposals to see what our applicants tell us about that. And what's the criteria for the RFP? How are these organizations being chosen? I, for that, I would like to refer you specifically to the RFP rather than have me paraphrase how they'll be chosen. The criteria is posted both on the HRA website and Thrive and um, we, the, the due date is April 23rd. I encourage organizations to apply if they're interested and uh, we look forward to a very exciting program. All right, thank you. I'll yield back to committee council, Sarah Liz. Thank you very much, chair. And I see that council member Rosenthal has a question. I'm starts now. Great, thank you so much. And I apologize. I'm in my office, I'll flip my screen. Um, but anyway, thank you so much uh, for this hearing, Chair Lewis, it's a really important topic. And um, Director Herman, you know, I'm a huge fan. So thank you for all the effort and smarts you put into this work. Um, the city's lucky to have you. Thank you. I'm wondering about um, two things. Um, one, for the RFP, how much money is going into this? How much money will the city spend? This is um, an investment that will be about $3.7 million over a two-year period. It's a two-year demonstration project. Okay, 3.7, so about 1.7, sorry. Right. Um, so, so about 2 million, shy of 2 million a year. And that'll start when? Fiscal year 22? Uh, or what month? Well, we hope that it will actually begin, that the work of it will begin in June. So there'll be a little bit in FY21, but it will go mid-June, say 2021 through mid-June 2023. Got it. And um, uh, how many groups are you expecting to choose? So we will have three, what we're calling anchor organizations. I One, see, that's subcontract. Okay. Each anchor organization will bring as part of their team, five CBOs, five community-based organizations and five primary care providers. How much money will each anchor provider get roughly? Well, that's part of the proposal, how they will divide up the money. Okay, so each anchor group each year gets about a million dollars. Well, I'm not shy sure of a million that way. Do we, also, we also have telehealth, telemental health provider which is H&H, &H, and they will get some of the funding. And they will get some of the funding. So each anchor provider might get like 600, 700,000. They are asked to propose how much they will get and how they will distribute the funding to the primary care providers and the um, social service agencies. Right. Director Herman, the reason I'm drilling down on this sure. is simply um, because we've all seen the magnitude of the need, but we've all seen also, to your point, that it's the culturally 
competent groups that can really serve our communities. Um, so I'm just trying to wrap my head around about how much money each group would get and then what are we asking them to do? And through really sloppy mental math, it sounds like we'll give each nonprofit about enough money to pay for one staffer to do this work. We're, Is that a fair? We're not asking the nonprofits to provide the telemental health. We're asking H and H to provide the telemental health. We're asking the anchor organizations to help with a public education campaign and to work with H and H to provide. Um, training to make sure that with all of the bilingual capacity that they have, that they're even better at cultural responsiveness. And we're asking the social service agencies to provide places for people and to encourage appropriate people to access telemental health. We're not asking. Uh, them to I'm, got it. I'm sorry. I was late to the hearing. Okay. Thank you. Um, to provide places, okay. And to um, refer appropriate people and encourage them clearly. But I HCH see, I is see. the provider. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. Okay, so the majority of the funding, you would educate the nonprofits basically to educate their staff, right? To refer people to the tele mental health. Think, much for it. Okay, so I have another set of questions. Chair Lewis may have a little bit more time. Please do. Okay, thank you. Um, Director Herman, I am wondering what you think about the incident of um, the hate crime against the, the uh, uh, I'm gonna say middle-aged Asian woman um, who was kicked and, and beaten on the street um, in the last week. What is the, what, as soon as the police identify the man and, and um, apprehend him, what's the, what's the right response outside of the criminal justice response. What's the right response for how we prevent this from happening again in your mind's eye? I think Dr. Harrison is trying to. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering council member if you'd like me to take this I'm, from the. the absolutely. I'm on my phone, so I can only see one person at a time. So yes, of course. Thank you. Okay. So so let me um, let me um, address your question. Uh, I, I I think uh, you're asking a, a fundamentally important question, and that is, um, and, and it's complicated by you know this the, the, this horrific hate crime issue. You know issues of violence against. Uh, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, you know, it, it's something that we are all horrified by and, and need to be very concerned about it. I also want to um, say that um, if, I, I mean, I think, I, I think we need to say a few things about um, these sorts of incidents. Um, one is that um, hate, is not a mental illness. And, uh, you know, we need to think about the societal city uh, response to these issues outside of thinking about this solely as a mental health concern. But having said that, I also want to make sure that we don't neglect issues around mental health and mental illness. Um, and I want to remind folks here that people with mental illness are more likely to be victims of crimes than perpetrators of crime. So um, I want us to remember that. And, and yet, if there is somebody with mental illness that we um, make sure we are 
aiming to connect them to care and services in uh, the, the best ways that we have and know. And so if there's somebody coming to the attention of the community um, or communities um, with signs and symptoms of mental illness, we, we should know what to do about that and how to respond to that. And knowing that um, there are resources outside of, uh, of legal, you know, criminal justice and police response, we should be aware of that as well. So in New York City, we have mobile crisis teams who are available to respond to crises in communities, in homes. They are accessible through NYC Well, 888 NYC Well. Anybody can call. Um, we know that, you know, we've got to respond faster than we have with those sorts of programs. Um, but I know that's something that, and something that we're working on. Um, and I think one of the last hearings we were at together, um, Susan Herman spoke about a pilot program, which is a diversion um, for 911 for people who have yeah. health crisis concerns. So, you know, I think we've got to be thinking about all of those types of responses um, and connections for people who do have um, mental health needs when it isn't just a criminal justice um, safety issue when it does involve uh, more complex issues. I mean, maybe I'm making some assumptions about the person who did this. Um, maybe I'm making some assumptions, but I guess more, most importantly, what I was hoping you would, I would sort of call out from what you're saying, all of which is incredibly important, is how could we have gotten to this guy, this guy, sooner and gotten him the help he needs so that this wouldn't have happened? Um, and I, that, yeah, so. So, um, and that, that, that again is a really good question. And the other resources that I didn't mention a few minutes ago to, for us to be aware of and to help make connections to is assisted outpatient treatment, which is court mandated treatment for individuals who qualify, um, which is another way to, to help people stay connected to care if they qualify for legally mandated Outpatient Let me ask services. another question. Will in this situation, will there be, uh, if there's mental health issues involved, if the police identify the person, apprehend him, will there be a connection to some sort of mental health service for this gentleman? So or how can't... could there be? How could how does the system work? So, yeah. Yeah, that, again, thank you. I don't think I can, I can't comment on any one specific situation or individual um, for, for various reasons. And um, I, don't, I don't think that will um, help no, us no, here. No. However, so, I, I, so I should, me, I, can I actually add one more? more? Broadly. Yeah. Sorry, more broadly then. So it, we've been spending time trying to build up the city's resources for individuals who have histories of falling through the cracks of the system. And we've been doing that through um, lots of work with Thrive NYC, which is you know, one of their main goals in terms of preventing, um, again, people from falling through the cracks. So there are numbers of services that we have put in place that, that or that we've grown over the years that haven't been there before. Um, and, um, for instance, a program such as our support and connection centers where police can bring individuals who have behavioral health concerns to a setting for an assessment and evaluation outside of an emergency room. And, uh, you know, I also, so in addition to support and connection centers, and I, I heard public advocate Williams mention them in his opening comments as well. We've increased our access to mobile treatment 
uh, for individuals out in New York City over these last five or six years. We've created new programs called intensive mobile treatment where you don't have to have a diagnosis. Um, you may be homeless, you may have criminal inv legal involvement, you may have substance use. And we've, um, we have 11 of those programs operating now. And we had zero of them six years ago. So we've been working towards increasing access to care for people who really do have, um, our system has failed them before. And um, I can mention additional um, forensic assertive community treatment programs. I mentioned mobile crisis teams available where we are working toward a more rapid response. So there have been a number, I'm sure I'm leaving some of the expansion sure, sure. efforts out, no, but there have been a number that. of those throughout. Yeah, I appreciate that. And more details I think would be important for the council. So as you, if you do have lists of those, I think the council would be interested in seeing it. And I, See, my colleague has his hand up. I, I just want to pursue this just for one minute and then maybe I'll come back. But like, um, we had a briefing yesterday by our police, our local police precincts about some crimes that have been happening in the district. And all of them fundamentally need the perpetrators need social services, right? So, so the police like to say, oh, they're just revolving. We call them the revolving. We know these two guys, they've been in and out of the system 24 times. Gosh, uh, is anyone else inter interfacing? with those people who have been in and out of the system 24 times besides the NYPD? Is there a system set up that you have I, through any of these programs with the PD where they're encouraged to refer these types of cases out? Both my precincts say it With, with the intended goal of getting more police officers, right? So what they're saying to me is, we've got these roving criminals who go in and out of the justice system. We arrest them, they go out. We arrest, an hour later, we arrested the same guy. And, and their answer, they say to me, so we need more police. What is that the, the administration's thinking and our precincts being given other options or is that as far as it goes? Because we do have CVAPs, you know, we have a couple of, I guess, social service people in the NYPD. Do you understand where I'm going with that? So I can, I, I'll start off and it looks like Susan might wanna respond as well, um, to say that we have resources that we've added over the years from the mental health perspective. And I'm gonna name two. One are our co-response teams. These are uh, police officers teamed up with mental health clinicians um, who are available to go out um, for individuals that, you know, may be similar to what you've described, where there's concerns about repeated um, involvement um, with legal issues that, you know, really might be behavioral health focused. And, and is that in every district or just the ones that are, have the highest crime levels? Because I don't think my district has those. So, so, so let me just, so there's co-response teams and then there are also heat teams health engagement and assessment teams, which are clinicians um, paired up with peers, people with lived experience, lived mental health experience or justice experience, who are available to go out to folks again in the community. These are accessible through um, a triage desk and police are able to make referrals to the triage desk for individuals that they are concerned about. And able is very different from do. 
right? Sure. And, and, and I hear you on that. So, yeah. so well, you know, whatever. and people have to know and use it, um, but those are services available and we've increased our heat teams recently um, and uh, they there are going to be um, more of them available. I don't know, Susan, would you like to add anything to what I've said from- I think, I think you, you covered it. I would just say the, the police officers in your district, council member Rosenthal, um, should be aware of the fact that co-response teams operate citywide and that heat teams operate citywide. And they can, there is now a behavioral health unit in the police department. They can call the unit, they can talk to the unit about particular issues that they have. They can call in um, and talk about a particular person to the triage desk and the triage desk can decide whether it makes sense to send a heat team or to send a co-response team. But the complaint about the criminal justice system being a revolving door is as, as I think you are indicating, it's a critique of the criminal justice system as much as it's a critique of every, everything else. And to the extent that we can make the criminal justice system um, more effective in its rehabilitation mission, as well as its punitive mission, yeah. Thank you. Um, we may we may be better off. Um, Look, I'm not gonna keep. I'm gonna stop. But it is. I do think it's interesting that on this call, I didn't hear about either of those things. I mean, this was a call with the heads of two precincts and uh, the electeds, and saying, you know, what can we do to help here? And the answer was from one precinct, nothing you know, give us more cops. And the other precinct did a little better. They said, we have now youth officers in the NYPD and those youth officers are visiting the homes of the knuckleheads once a week. But similarly, they sort of, you know, toss up their hands and said, you know, no one's home. So of course these kids are on the street doing this. Again, at least they're going to the home, but I don't see any connection to social services. But perhaps we've gotten off track and I want to defer to my colleagues. Um, you know, a lot of times in government, I think we think the system's working and maybe it is for a couple of precincts and, and it's not for a couple of others. Um, so maybe we can follow up. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Council Member Rosenthal. Um, and we'll next turn to Council Member Riley. Just a reminder again to Council Members, if you have questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Um, and we'll go to the public panel after that. Thank you very much. So Council Member Riley, you can go as soon as the Sergeant cues you. Time starts now. Thank you, Council. And uh, thank you, Chair Lewis, for this opportunity. I won't take too long. Um, Thank you for the testimony this morning, Dr. Harrison and Director Herman. I just wanted to uh, see if we could just uh, further explain the resources out there for students who have been going through such a, you know, traumatic uh, transition during this pandemic. Uh, we do have many high school students who are even able to play in their athletic sports. Um, some that weren't able to go to prom, some that won't even be able to graduate and do simple, uh, simple things that we all may have done when we were in high school or our collegiate years. So just want to emphasize and, and speak about those resources that we have uh, for those students and also for the parents, uh, the parents who have younger, stu um, younger students like myself. Um, who have uh, students that, you know, aren't able to socialize uh, with their peers. So if there are any programs and resources out there, I uh, just want to emphasize, I'm sorry if you, you spoke about this earlier, but I uh, just wanted to speak about them now if possible. And I do appreciate all the work you have done. Great. Thank you so much for that question. I, you know, I think that um, you're spot on to ask about, you know, the needs of kids. Again, we are living through uh, something we have not lived through before that that clearly um, is going to impact all of us um, and all you know everybody uh, in our families, kids, adults um, throughout the communities. And um, 
you know, thinking through the needs of kids and families has been critically um, important to us. From the pandemic perspective, there is uh, information on the health department's website in terms of managing um, stress and coping, both from the perspective of adults as well as parents um, and for kids. And uh, I can help point you to, to those materials if you haven't seen them. They have been translated into many, many languages. Um, and I understand that I, I cannot speak um, for the programs that um, Department of Edu Education is working on now, but I understand um, that there are um, some uh, resources through the DOE as well. I don't know, Susan, do you are, want to are, add anything are from Are there any, I'm sorry to cut you off, Doctor. Are there any programs with our CUNY um, schools for, for our kids that are in college? Um, Susan, do you want to, do you want to, um, I'd like to, I, if I can jump in, I can talk a little bit first about what our students that are in our, um, throughout the public school system have available to them in addition to the, um, the resources that are on the health department's website, there are also particular resources geared for students and young people on the Thrive website, uh, services that can be accessed while staying at home. In addition to that, Every, every school in the city has access to mental health care in one form or another. So there's either an on-site clinic, there's access to a clinic working in partnership with a community-based organization. We have school response clinicians who respond to schools if students are experiencing particular distress and they can counsel them uh, they might counsel a whole classroom if something upsetting happened to a classroom, and they can stay with that student if needed until that student is connected to care. So there's on-site services as we open up. There's um, people who come to the school, the school response clinicians in times of particular trauma or stress. And there's also school mental health specialists who work with schools to both increase the capacity of school staff and teachers to work with students effectively and, and appreciate their mental health needs. And they also will be, um, if they haven't already um, started running groups for students who are, are particularly troubled and would like to have a little bit more attention and they'll, they'll run groups for them. So we have, we have a lot of resources. We also have created something called Pathways to Care, which is a partnership between DOE and health and hospitals, where we're starting in the 33 communities that have been hardest hit by COVID. We're currently working in about 44 schools, but soon hundreds more will be added. We're going by each child and adolescent clinic that H and H runs, and associating them with schools that have on-site resources. Okay, thank and you, director. Jumping in. <laughs> thank you, director, and thank you, Dr. Harrison. Uh, thank you, chair, for this opportunity, and I would like to yield my time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member Riley. And again, just one other uh, reminder to the public that you will be testifying next after this. And right now, uh, if any other council members have any questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Uh, and Chair Lewis, we can turn back to you for some further questions. All right, thank you. I'll be quick um, as I see hands up from, uh, from the public. Earlier, I was trying to ask uh, Dr. Barron a question and wanted to know if everything is working now. So I could quickly ask that question. Is he still on? Perfect. Um, I wanted to know what is the city doing to increase cultural competency among health providers, um, particularly those in H and H facilities. We can't hear you. He's not on mute though. Uh, 
Oh, Dr. Barron, we're still having difficulty listening, uh, hearing you. So we're going to turn back to the chair for any other questions she may have for either Director Herman or Dr. Harrison. Sure. Um, and I want to thank uh, Councilmember Rosenthal for kind of opening this Pandora's box a little bit. Um, so I just I just have a quick question. Um, as I was listening to Ex Executive Director Herman um, and Dr. Harrison speak, um, I was thinking about the referral process when when folks are um, in contact with agencies. So my question is, how are individuals who are deemed mentally ill by other agencies, for example, if a homeless person uh, that is deemed mentally ill by DSS um, wants to access the DOHMH system, um, how does that process work? How do you all coordinate? That's a, a fantastic question. Um, thank you for asking it. So when there's somebody within any other system um, and they would like to have access to one of the mobile treatment services, for instance, which is one of the ones that we um, have the single point of access for, they make a referral um, to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and, and share the information that we need to know um, so that we can then assign that person to a treatment provider. And, and we have um, spent the last about a year and a few months um, working on improving coordination across various services and systems such as Department of Homeless Services, Correctional Health Services for people coming from Rikers Island, health and hospitals. We have been um, sharing information across our uh, various service systems so that we can help um, keep the connections and the flow going so that um, we can um, see for somebody who's making a referral that the information is, is complete and accurate and getting to us in a timely way, that we are making the referrals uh, in a timely way and that folks are connecting to care. Um, and we are measuring and monitoring how well that we've been uh, doing that as, uh, as well across these various agencies. Thank you for that. And I wanted to go back to the community anchor uh, conversation we were all having earlier. I wanted to ask, um, how are we requesting or asking the anchor organizations to assist with the public education campaign? Like what metrics are being used to ensure that they can um, effectively provide the information to the community? They will be um, essentially asked to design these public awareness campaigns, work with the community to do that. And what metrics are being used to measure if it's effective or not. I know that they have to put this information to our into they our do. they do. So I can't I can't talk about that. They will propose how they will measure effectiveness and they will propose how they will um, create sustainability plans as well. Okay, so will this information, I guess after the RFP is um, closed. Um, will this information and data from, from the program be publicly available? There will be metrics about reach and about impact posted about Communities Thrive, as there are metrics about reach and impact about every single Thrive program posted on our website. Every single one is on our dashboard with um, data about how many people they've served and what the impact of the work has been. Um, and last question on the anchor program. So one, one of the goals of community, Communities Thrive is to provide telehealth and mental health services to underserved communities. So will the program include funding to support technical upgrades and purchases for New Yorkers without internet access? I know you mentioned earlier, Executive Director Herman, that h, &H will play a role in this, but how, how will that look? Well, the equipment for the tele mental health sessions will be part will be provided as part of this program within the CBOs and the primary care providers. But something that H and H has done that I think hasn't gotten a lot of attention is that 
they have also provided cell phones and service for people to help keep them connected to telemental health. During the pandemic, they've done that for hundreds and hundreds of people. And if that's necessary in this program, um, they will likely do that as well. All right, thank you. I'll yield back to Committee Council Sarlis. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and I'm gonna just pause here to see if there are any second round of questions for any council members before we turn to the public. I know the public is very eager to go right now. Okay, so we can turn back to you, uh, Chair Lewis, for any closing remarks that you may have uh, before we can, and then turn to any members of the administration if they have any closing remarks. I just wanted to thank the administration uh, and service providers for testifying today at this oversight hearing in relation to access to mental health care in communities of color. While mental health is not a sexy topic, it is even more relevant today as millions of New Yorkers are still struggling to recover from the devastating toll of the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we recognize the depth of work that we need to urgently, urgently but thoughtfully undertake to remove the barriers to mental health care in communities of color in this city who have experienced generations of racial disparities in our hospitals and neighborhood clinics. I definitely want to thank committee staff Sarah Liss, um, sorry, senior counsel Sarah Liss, legislative policy analyst Christy Dwyer, and financial analyst uh, Lauren Hunt, and legislative intern uh, Stephen Aspermonte for helping and making this hearing possible today. I look forward to working with all of you to continue to address this matter. Uh, and I will yield back to Sarah Liss. Thank you very much, Chair. And that concludes this panel of the administration. We thank you all for coming here today. Um, and we'll now move on to public testimony. So just a couple of procedural items. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. And again, as before, there may be a few seconds of delay before you're unmuted. So we thank you in advance for your patience. Um, and the first panel that we will be going to uh, for hear from the public is going to be Zainab Tawil, Ju Han, Joy Luang Faze, and Yuna Yoon. Uh, so Zainab, as soon as the, the Sergeant cues you, you can begin your testimony. Thank you. Time starts now. Oh, uh, let's just pause the clock. We'll just work to unmute Zainab. Apologies about that. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Chairperson Ayala, members of the Community on Mental Health and Disabilities and Addiction, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify before you here today. My name is Zainab Tawil, and I'm a mental health caseworker with the Arab American Association of New York. To say that there's a profound mental health crisis in New York's Arab American community would be an understatement. A particular worry during the COVID-19 pandemic is the rise in domestic violence in our community due to the exacerbated conditions created by the pandemic. It's an unfortunate truth that in some Arab households, women find themselves victimized at the hands of abusive partners who wield absolute power over their lives. Organizations like mine provide women <clears throat> at risk of falling into these situations with resources and information that could protect them from abuse. And we have thought to keep doing so during the pandemic. However, at-home quarantines, loss of access to culturally acceptable spaces outside the home, and increasing household tensions surrounding at-home schooling and loss of income have put thousands of Arab women in situations where their lives are literally on the line. As this pandemic shuts down and cuts off our community from mental health resources, we anticipate these negative impacts will increase and intensify the longer the pandemic carries on. The stigma surrounding mental health care in the Arab community destroys lives every day and having the resources to meet our community where they are and provide life-saving care is essential. The Arab community is not alone in this struggle. We are just um, one of countless communities of color without ready access to mental health care in New York. Whether they've just arrived in this country or if they've spent entire lives here, every New Yorker deserves and needs mental health support and we need city council to step up and provide this support as much as they can. 
Especially with the rise in hate crimes, it is imperative that the city support initiatives coming from the voices of our most vulnerable community members, including the Asian American community, which has faced countless hate crimes in the past year alone. Initiatives like Hope Against Change created by the Asian American Federation, aimed at obtaining funding for Asian American <clears throat> organizations who are doing the ground on the on the ground work fighting against anti-Asian hate by building resiliency within our communities. This initiative is critical to ensure the mental health needs of survivors of anti-Asian violence are met. City Council could play a critical role in supporting survivors of violence across the board and guaranteeing that this work continues to stop violence by continuing to fund organizations like ours. Thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. We'll next turn to Juhan, and you can begin as soon as the, the sergeant cues you. Time starts now. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Lewis, and all committee members for holding this important hearing today. I'm Juhan. I'm the Deputy Director of the Asian American Federation. Since the beginning of COVID, the Asian American community has withstood uh, an unending trauma from experiencing the highest increase in unemployment rates across all racial groups to our seniors suffering severe depression the surge in anti-Asian violence that has compounded the mental health burden of the poorest community in New York City. For a community that already struggles with deep stigma, which is the biggest deterrent to accessing services, as well as multiple systemic barriers, Asians are the least likely of racial groups to utilize mental health services. When you consider the racial trauma of being attacked on a daily basis, Asian New Yorkers are facing a public health crisis within a public health crisis. In this unimaginable year, mental health has become inextricable, inextricable from public health. In the case of the Asian community, it's become synonymous with public safety. We must reimagine what mental health means in this moment for a community that has not only lost jobs at the highest rate in New York City, but also regularly faced shootings, stabbings, and other forms of violence. Mental health during COVID means all the ways that our public, our physical safety is, is addressed so that our mental health is protected from further trauma. As an organization that has led the response to the surge in anti-Asian violence since January 2020, but the Asian American Federation urges city council to integrate and support all programming that aims to reduce the mental health impact of Asian hate crimes across all agencies. We cannot leave public safety simply strictly in the hands of the NYPD, which is limited in its ability to provide meaningful safety for our community. The Federation has tracked over 1,100 bias incidents across our reporting tool, as well as Stop API Hate, NYPD, and Commission on Human Rights, which equates to more than one incident every eight hours from March of 2020 to February 2021. This number actually only accounts for about 10 to 30 percent of the number actual number of incidents due to the drastic underreporting in our community. Yet the majority of surveyed Asian Americans have also said that their mental health has been impacted by the rise in violence. So to provide immediate safety solutions to Asian New Yorkers, the Asian American Federation recently launched our Hope Against Hate campaign. The campaign also seeks to support the work of our mental health panels here on this, uh, partners who are on this panel and working tirelessly to support the uptick in demand for culturally competent mental health services. Um, across federal, state, and city, we're asking for a $30 million investment to send the tide of anti-Asian violence with community center strategies that have proven to work. Because we're in the thick of city budget discussions, we're asking for city council to step up with new initiative funding for this work because we will need widespread support to reduce these daily attacks on Asian New Yorkers. Our campaign will centralize the reporting of bias incidents through an in-language reporting tool in order to connect victims to the support that they need, establish safety programs in Asian majority neighborhoods in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens, outreach to local small businesses and faith, and faith centers to establish safe zones where individuals can go to seek help and support if they're ever being targeted, provide upstander verbal de-escalation and physical self-defense trainings in multiple Asian languages, and set up in-language victim support services, including assistance fund to help with assault-related expenses and mental health support in the languages and um, the cultures that they need. On behalf of the Asian American Federation, I thank you for your support, and we look forward to working with all of you to address <coughs> this crisis and the mental health toll is taking on the Asian American community. Thank you so much. And we'll next turn to Joy Luang Faze. You can begin as soon as the Sergeant cues you. Time starts now. Good morning. My name is Joy Luang Faze, Assistant Executive Director of Behavioral Health Services at Hamilton Madison House, or HMH. First, I, like, I would like to thank the City Council Member and Chair Lewis Graham for this important hearing. HMH is a multifaceted community service organization operating in Chinatown on the Lower East Side and beyond. Our program focuses on early childhood early childhood education, serving seniors and subject on um, the subject upon what we're focusing on, behavioral health. We specialize in providing behavioral health services to people of Asian descent, in fact, are the largest outpatient behavioral health provider for this population on the East Coast. Currently, we operate five mental health clinics, a day treatment program, and a supportive housing program for adults coping with severe 
mental health issues. Our staff are at least bilingual and languages spoken among them are Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Cambodian, and Vietnamese. The large majority of these we serve, the people that we serve are first generation immigrants of low income status and many are receiving therapy for the first time. Consistently, they share that their mental health symptoms relating to difficulties with employment, finances, housing, immigration status, and health. Combounding the situation is the stigma associated with therapy in the Asian American community. The effects of the COVID and the anxiety provoked by the recent shares of racial incidents targeting Asian Americans. The recent report released by the Stop AAPIH released nearly 3,800 incidents were reported over the course of a, roughly over a year. And we believe that that's a tiny fraction of the total. HMH has seen an increase of individuals seeking support and mental health services by 10% in the last three months and 25% since the pandemic. The fears of being attacked, increased anxiety and depression are common issues reported. For all these reasons, we believe it is imperative that the city council makes it a priority to fund initiatives and work with community organizations and mental health providers to tackle anti-Asian violence and further expand mental health services. Following are the recommendations. An anti-Asian against violence campaign such as Hope Against Hate should be undertaken and funded to encourage Asian Americans to make use of mental health services, as well as to engage them in other social health and educational programs that could prevent mental health from arising. As earlier discussed, this was a shortage of mental health clinician. It is even more so in the Asian community. We, per we, pursue, we should pursue strategies to attract more Asian Americans into the mental health field to incentivize employment employing them at community-based organizations where we have already earned the trust of the community. Additionally, funding should be available to organizations that are already providing the critical support to ensure mental health needs of survivors of anti-Asian violence in neighbor Asian neighborhoods are met. Hamilton and Madison's House would like to thank the Committee of Immigration and the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addictions, and we would be gal gladly to engage in ongoing discussions to foster That's better right. mental health among Asian Americans and all New Yorkers. Thank you so much. And we'll next turn to Yuna Yoon. And you can begin when the Sergeant cues you. Time starts now. Thank you Council and Chair Lewis for this opportunity. And as Chair Lewis emphasized, we need more support for POC as a whole. Thank you for those who professionally and as individuals show solidarity and allyship during such a difficult time for Asian Americans. Calls coming into KCS, the only state licensed clinic targeting the Korean community, taking majority Medicaid and Medicare, jumped dramatically and our wait list has grown. It shouldn't come as a surprise. People who appear on the news for anti-Asian hate crimes are reaching out to community-based mental health clinics such as KCS because we have trust in the community to do the difficult work of processing their and their families' pain. When the same issue is impacting multiple systems from medical to law enforcement and security officers to the criminal legal system, clients finally come to us carrying all of that with them. Um, they take a leap of faith that they can heal and bravely work towards feeling safe to leave the house again and carry on with their lives, even while still, still dealing with pending cases and the uncertainties and disappointments. In directing a clinic, I'm speaking as a social worker with a dual responsibility of maintaining patient confidentiality, but also upholding our code of ethics where within and outside of our professional roles, we have a commitment to advocate for social justice. When people can't open up to others when investigations are pending, when they express concerns about systems not meeting or providing sufficient resources for their needs, the impact that mental health professionals have when they hold space for their trauma is absolutely priceless. And yet there's limited research with sufficient disaggregated data that can provide more intensive and tailored approaches and can help us make cases for the kind of funding that we may qualify for and deserve. As the demand for support rises due to the sheer number of attacks and the direct physical impact and sense of safety um, that the community has among their fellow New Yorkers, this is a shared responsibility. My staff also must have all the support they need to provide this essential work without vicarious trauma and burnout. Even for myself, as I go about my day and have conversations with various incoming clients and my staff, it's just not okay. We can do better. And with your support, we can make a start. Thank you. Thank you so much to this entire panel. And I'm gonna pause briefly now to see if there are any council member questions. 
Okay. Thanks again to this panel. And we'll next turn to our following panel, which will include Erica McSwain, Nadia Chait, Fiona O'Grady, and Kimberly Blair. Uh, and we'll begin with Erica McSwain. And you can begin as soon as you're unmuted and the sergeant cues you. Time starts now. Good morning, Council Chair Lewis and esteemed council members. My name is Erica McSwain. I'm the director at the Queens Community Justice Center, which is a demonstration project for the Center for Court Innovation. Young people involved in the justice system have often experienced a history of significant trauma. The burden of processing and acknowledging the trauma should not fall on young people who are in no position to do it alone. Our young people of color report a lack of comfortability in traditional therapeutic settings operated by individuals unfamiliar with their unique needs. With the populations we serve facing ongoing police violence and a public health crisis with that disproportionately impacts black and brown communities, realizing the vision and equitable access to mental health services is now more important than ever. Young men of color are underserved oppressed and victimized by current systems. And the Center for Court Innovation offers trauma responses across the city that adequately and appropriately address the victimization. At the Center for Court Innovation's Neighbor in Action site, we provide comprehensive trauma-informed services to young men of color between the ages of 16 and 24. To address these impacts of various pressures, we provide therapeutic services, which include psychotherapy, psychoeducation with culturally responsive delivery, intensive case management and mentorship to support them in recognizing their trauma and engage in healing. In Queens, the Queens Community Justice Center provides comprehensive services to young people harmed by violence by similarly taking a trauma-informed, culturally competent, holistic approach to work with each participant. Uplift is a trauma-informed, culturally competent victim service program for young people in Queens who have experienced victimization and or exposure to violence by providing client-driven individual therapeutic sessions and supportive workshops. Queens Community Justice Center is ready to implement Uplift with support from council and transition services from mandated involvement to voluntary meaningful engagement for young people of color in Queens. The center's Harlem Community Justice Center builds on this evidence-based approach to, to mental health through the Men's Empowerment Program, which provides trauma-informed programming and mental health interventions to young and Black, brown men who have experienced trauma of mass incarceration and or community violence in East and Central Harlem. In 2020, the council, with council support, the center's Staten Island Justice Center began providing more robust programming, uh, mental health services to youth who are just as involved or have experienced a history of trauma through the Youth Wellness Initiative. Um, they also plan to expand these programming to include workshops designed to address trauma and produce healing. The Center for Court Innovation is committed to working with council to ensure the needs of marginalized New Yorkers are addressed through access to mental health services and support. We thank the council for its continued partnership That's and will be available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and we'll next turn to Nadia Chait, and you can begin as soon as the council, as the sergeant cues you. The time starts now. Thank you, Chair Lewis and members of the council for holding this hearing on a, such a critical topic. I'm Nadia Chait, the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Coalition for Behavioral Health. Our members are our community-based mental health and substance use providers who are truly embedded in New York's communities and working in the communities they serve every day to meet their needs. It's for this reason that our, the majority of individuals that our members serve are people of color and that the majority of people who are employed by our members are people of color. And so we're working every day to address many of the issues that have been raised today. And yet, as you rightly noted, Chair Lewis, this is a longstanding issue, one that you know started before COVID, certainly been worsened by the pandemic, um, and one that needs solutions that we as providers have not been able to accomplish on our own. We need assistance from government to truly be able to meet the needs in our communities. It's clear to us that one of the biggest challenges in providing care is that our workforce is simply insufficient um, due to low Medicaid rates and insufficient city contract funding. Um, our staff simply are not paid the wages that they deserve. And in addition, many of the structural barriers um, 
that lead to, you know, that were discussed earlier that lead to individuals of color um, often having higher mental health needs similarly impact the ability of individuals of color to enter our field, which often requires master's degrees um, and significant levels of student debt that unfortunately are not, um, you know, really mitigated at all um, by city or state programs. And so to increase our workforce and really increase the capacity of our system to get rid of the wait list and the appointment delays that folks reaching out for help encounter far too often, um, we would really encourage the city to look at creating more sustainable funding streams for our providers. So that would include fully funding the indirect cost rate initiative so that providers costs are actually covered increasing funding on city contracts to provide higher salaries for staff and to support our staff. Um, and then really investing in the city council's mental health initiatives. Um, you know, I think that funding does a remarkable job at targeting services to communities where the need is very high. And obviously you all as council members know your communities, know where that need is. Um, but the cuts last year did have a really detrimental impact. 40% um, of the funded providers that we surveyed reported serving fewer people. So bringing that funding back at minimum to the FY20 baseline, but we would really encourage increases in that funding for FY22. Um, and then really funding programs in the community, not expecting folks um, you know, to go outside of their community or to go to hospitals, funding programs where they are, in senior centers, in schools, um, in homeless counselors. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And we'll next turn to Fiona O'Grady. And as soon as the host unmutes you and the sergeant cues you, you can begin. Time starts now. Oh, you're still on mute. Uh, let's just wait for the host to unmute you. You may have to accept a, an unmute prompt. That's better. Good morning. My name is Fianna O'Grady and on behalf of Samaritan Suicide Prevention Center, the only community-based organization in New York City who is, uh, whose sole mission is preventing suicide. I want to thank the New York City Council Committee on Mental Health, um, its chair Farah Lewis and members for the opportunity to speak today. With the intense social and cultural stigma and the very real fears people in distress have about uh, safely accessing mental health services in NYC, the need for today's hearing and more importantly, significant action cannot be overstated. This is especially true for people of color and those living in poverty, which research shows face greater difficulty in accessing and receiving needed healthcare services than other city residents. These challenges can be overwhelming to someone who is already feeling anxious, overwhelmed and hopeless. And then add to that the way so many NYC clinical services operate and the role of police have in responding to mental health emergencies and a process that can be intimidating to anyone, even those with the greatest privilege and social standing can become absolutely frightening, if not potentially life-threatening. There are no clear magic answers. And as Samaritans has advised this council for years, just adding new services and expanding others does not change the underlying issues, the structural flaws that are at the heart of NYC's helping institutions. The fact is you cannot control how people get help. The history of suicide prevention has taught us that the more choices people have, the more options people can explore, the more likely they are to seek the help they need. But people do not seek help if they do not feel safe. They do not seek help from those they do not trust. They do not seek help when the people providing that help treat them as problems to be solved instead of the complex and dimensional individuals they are. From Samaritan's perspectives, alternatives to existing services must be supported and enhanced. Samaritan's is but one example. We offer the only completely confidential crisis hotline in the city, which means no action is taken against a caller's desire, no police sent in response to their calls. This is in complete contrast to the active rescues that are initiated by most city clinical services that can result in so many unintended consequences. But instead of supporting Samaritans and other valuable community-based services with a proven record of effectiveness in reaching New York's diverse populations, 
the mayor and DOH and MAGE continue to invest in new, often unproven programs, never realizing that you can't be an alternative to yourself, no matter what the packaging and the PR. Samaritans also suggests, as we stated in council committee staff, that you can consider changing the protocol tied to 911 mental health calls, as well as the city's mobile crisis units, so that, the, that staff responding to mental health emergencies are accompanied by EMS, which have tremendous experience in handling crisis situations and do not carry firearms. Time is up, I'll send it in. I thank you. Um, Samaritans is here to help and believes some of the needs can be addressed by our city's diverse community-based organizations. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, we'll next turn to Kimberly Blair. And as soon as you're unmuted by the host and the Sergeant QZ, you can begin. Time starts now. Good morning, Chair Lewis and members of the committee. My name is Kimberly Blair and I'm here testifying today on behalf of NAMI NYC, an organization that has provided support services for the mental health community for almost 40 years, including our peer-led, peer-run helpline, which provides emotional support, psychoeducation, and community-based referrals to callers, nearly half of whom are individuals with mental illness or family members from BIPOC communities across the city. Since the pandemic began, we have seen a twofold increase in the number of helpline calls, including a dramatic increase from parents concerned about police response to mental health crises with their children. One of the most heartbreaking calls during the pandemic came from a mother, a concerned mother calling on how best to support her son, a 23 year young black man, after she called 911 for mental care support while her son was in distress and instead was met by police who arrived with their guns drawn. As a result, her son fled the scene for fear of his life. He was later detained and transported to a facility for care. Although this event occurred towards the beginning of the pandemic, the mother still frequently calls our helpline to this day for different resources for her son, who has since become homeless for fears of returning to the home where the police once responded. As we know too well, the trauma, the trauma associated with police response to mental health crises is not unique to this story and often has resulted in more catastrophic consequences, such as the murder of 18 black and brown individuals with mental illness since 2015. NAMI NYC commends council members and the PA's office for taking a step in the right direction with intro 2210. However, it is our position that the legislation does not go far enough to remove the police entirely as mental health first responders and therefore will not remove the trauma imposed upon black and brown community members experiencing mental illness. As written, almost anything could constitute as a public safety emergency which would lead the NYPD to be dispatched going against the goal of the proposed reform bill. For this reason, NAMI NYC would like to point the committee to the CCIT NYC coalition's proposal for narrowly defining the term public safety emergency as when a person is causing seriously bodily harm or is wielding a weapon to harm themselves or others and no other non-police de-escalation measures can be safely taken. Items such as a pocket knife or scissors do not constitute as a weapon. Our organization believes that this could be the best model for eliminating police response uh, to mental health crisis and BIPOC majority communities since the proposal was community informed. In the story I just told, the son was not harming anyone, he was simply in crisis and as such deserved an appropriate mental health response consisting of peers and representatives from his community, not the police. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to this entire panel. I'm gonna pause briefly to see if there are any council member questions. Okay, seeing none, we can turn to the next panel, which will include Malaki Karaskila, Jasmine Bowden, Aaron Muller, and Scott Kearney. And Malaki, you can begin as soon as the sergeant cues you and you're unmuted by the host. Time starts now. Hello, Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction. My name is Malachi Karaskia, and I'm a member of the New York City Anti-Violence Project, AVP. AVP aims to end all forms of violence through advocacy, counseling, legal support, and community organizing. AVP is an organization that serves the LGBTQ and HIV affected communities and a membership that is predominantly black and, black and brown, trans and gender nonconforming people. We are here today to uplift that we deserve to have healthy communities. And for our community to thrive, we need systems that meet our immediate needs, like housing, education, and mental health services. 
there is a severe lack of mental health services for black and brown communities, especially the TGNC community. The few resources that do exist are not inclusive and are not culturally competent. We are in the middle of a global pandemic with a rise of hate violence, which increases the need for more mental services. My own experiences have shown the urgency of this issues for me and for others. I live alone in a subsidized apartment and last fall due to my deteriorating mental state compounded with the fear and anxiety of being harassed and attacked by someone I thought was a friend. I am reluctant to admit that I attempted to flee my third story apartment through an open window. By some miracle of God, I only suffered a sprained ankle. But can you imagine that after making it to the hospital and telling them that I jumped out of my third story window, no one even suggested that I speak to a mental health professional? It leaves me questioning, why is it that I've asked my PCP, my case manager, and my social worker about mental health care and received no answers? It shouldn't be so difficult for me to receive the mental health care I know I deserve and would benefit me. I am still to this day struggling to access care. It begs the question, does anyone out there really care? The city must do better by, prior by prioritizing our health and safety and invest in culturally competent services that can robustly respond to the range of circumstances causing and the in individuals experiencing mental health distress. One way the city can do this is by funding community-based organizations and not law enforcement. At AVP, we have a 24-hour bilingual hotline where we respond to violence and offer advocacy and counseling. There are organizations like ours that can do this work that the city can invest in, such as the Hate Violence Prevention Initiative. We urge the city to prioritize our community's health and safety, and it can start with meeting the basic needs of our community and offer mental health care that is easily accessible and inclusive of our, of our communities. Thank you for listening and the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much for your testimony. We'll next turn to Jasmine, and you can begin as soon as the sergeant cues you. Time starts now. Um, hi, committee. Hello, committee on mental health, disability, and addiction. My name is Jasmine, and I use she and he pronouns. I am also a member of the New York City Anti-Violence Project, AVP. AV, I'd like to emphasize again that AVP aims to end all forms of violence through legal services, counseling, advocacy, and community organizing. AVP is an organization that serves the LGBTQ and HIV affected communities and a membership that is predominantly black and brown and TGNC, which stands for transgender and non-conforming individuals who live, live their lives and their truth, but not accepted in society. It is clear there is a lack of mental health services for black and brown communities, especially the TGNC community that is historically underserved. Even the resources that exist are not inclusive and not culturally competent. We're here today to uplift what we deserve to have healthy communities and for our communities to thrive, we need systems that meet our need, immediate needs, housing, education, and mental health services. A lot of walk-ins and AVPs are to seek our help and receive services. Transgender youth deal with a lot of psychological abuse and sometimes feel suicidal. Through our 27 bilingual hotline, we're able to address some of these issues and offer counseling and advocacy. There are organizations like ours that can do this work which the city can invest in, such as the Hate Violence Prevention Initiative. The city must do better and prioritize our health and safety and invest in culturally competent services and community-based organizations and not law enforcement. We see the radical disparities when it comes to receiving care and see people who are struggling with mental health that feel isolated and alone. We urge the city to prioritize our community's health needs and offer mental health care that is easily accessible and inclusive to our communities. Thank you for listening to my testimony and for the opportunity to testify. Thank you so much. Uh, and we'll next turn to Aaron Muller. And Aaron, you can begin as soon as the Sergeant cues you. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Chair Lewis, for this opportunity and good morning to everyone in their respective places. I'm here today to testify as a mental health provider, advocate, and speaker. My name is Aaron Muller. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and owner of a private practice alongside my wife, Dr. Trudy Ann Gale. 
Our hopes in Open Our Practice, we wanted to shift the narrative of mental health in black and brown communities. We have serviced over 4,000 clients since our opening in 2016, the majority being persons of color. There are clients that we're not able to service due to systemic barriers. As a resident of Southeast Queens, there's an absence of mental health agency in our, in our area. This is a grave absence for our community. I use my social media platform to provide education and resources about mental health and stigma. With this, I received a notable amount of messages and thank yous for providing resources and support. I also refer them to other clinicians. However, there is a need for a bigger, more robust mental health system for persons of color in New York City. I'm wondering how the city can continue to push the conversation and narrative around stigma, um, how beneficial this can be. I would love to see a relaunch and push for Brothers Thrive and Sisters Thrive, which I facilitated two conversations uh, on Jamaica Avenue and Hostos College, and it was received very well. My suggestion is to have more clinicians of color involved in outreach and engaging persons of color in mental health. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll next turn to Scott Kearney and you can begin as soon as the sergeant cues you. Time starts now. Mr. Kearney, if you could accept the unmute and also if you'd like to turn your camera vertically, uh, you're showing up sideways. You're unmuted You're okay, now. Okay, I'm sorry about the camera. Can I go? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so there's 600, um, there's 300,000 um, uh, workers, civil servants. If one in five, uh, the statistic of one in five have mental illness, you have 60,000 potential mentally ill uh, civil servants. I was a civil servant and I was dismissed. Uh, I was an employee at New York City Parks for over 30 years. I was diagnosed with ADD, bipolar, ADHD. Uh, some accommodations recommended by my neurologist and psychiatrist were made. The most important one uh, to reduce my distraction, my agitation, uh, my irritability because of my conditions was an office. Uh, not giving me an office, I feel, was discriminatory uh, and provided harassment. And uh, it was, uh, it, it really stopped me from doing the important work that I was doing without any accommodations that should have been made. What happens is very often your supervisors and management have more authority over your accommodations than your neurologist and psychiatrist. This shouldn't be. By law, uh, you were required to provide the accommodations uh, in an office and uh, they're not always done. So I believe that, um, well, I, by the way, it's Equal Employment Opportunity uh, Commission, uh, state and city uh, human rights departments, and of course the ADA uh, require uh, accommodations for mental health disabilities. Uh, the management and administrations of our agencies, I think, have far too much latitude when they can uh, override the accommodations of a psychiatrist and neurologist. When you take away or don't provide an accommodation, legally, it becomes constructive dismissive dismission or uh, and that turns into wrongful termination, which essentially is firing a civil servant. You can't do that. If an accommodation is recommended by a reasonable recommendation that doesn't do untold uh, harm to the office or their management, you must give it to the employee. That may not be the case. There needs to be closer cooperation between all of your agencies uh, all 300,000 civil servants and uh, health and hospitals, whatever kind of organization is required to have the oversight that's, uh, that's needed. Constructive discharge or dismissal is a very serious charge. If you don't give somebody the accommodation, you are essentially doing constructive discharge, which is firing a civil servant. 
Time expired. Goodbye. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to this entire panel. I'm gonna pause briefly now to see if there are any council member questions. Um, Sarah, I don't, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to thank Malachi for his courage and for sharing his personal story today and for advocating and, and testifying today. I just wanted to thank everyone who testified today. This information is definitely helpful and I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Chair. We'll turn to our next panel now, which includes Peggy Herrera, Ruth Lowenkron, Felix Guzman, Joyce Kendrick, and Yao Ching. Peggy, you can begin as soon as the Sergeant cues you. Time starts now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, hold on one minute. I'm sorry, I'm at work, I just, but I'm ready. Okay, first I wanna say thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, thank you to Chair Lewis and the committee members. Um, good morning to everyone. My name is Peggy Herrera. I am a member and leader of Freedom Agenda and a mental health advocate. Um, I am a mother of a son who struggles with mental health issues. On August 25th, 2019, I was arrested when I called for help for my son during a crisis and the police showed up first instead of a mental health or the medical professionals. Instead of being helped, I was arrested and my son never received the help he needed. It is ridiculous that a mother be criminalized for calling for help. That day I stood in my doorway and prevented the police from coming into my house to interact with my son because I know how that has gone before for other members. People with mental health illnesses are 16 times more likely to be killed during a police encounter. Police cannot help us in a crisis because they are too busy criminalizing us, especially the black and brown community. Police don't take time to find out what happened before the crisis. Now in times when my son is facing a crisis and he needs to stay in his room where he feels safe, I need a safe place to stay instead of sleeping in my car. We know that there are other ways to do this. The STAR program in Denver and the CAHOOTS program in Oregon seem to be working. And here in New York City, we still have people dying. Mental health is a medical issue, not a police issue. But it's not just the crisis response system that has failed my son. It is the entire mental health system, or really lack of mental health system. As an advocate for my son, my biggest challenge is lack of resources. And when I reflect on it, I realize that it has always been the barrier to my son getting what he needs. Years ago, my son deserved a school system that offered him counselors and services to respond to behaviors that stem from trauma. As a young man whose trauma has been compounded by being criminalized so often, he needs access to unlimited mental health resources. My son should never worry about the amount of visits because no one can determine the amount of times he will have a crisis. We need a mental health system that will address and treat individuals before their actions and behaviors provoke a police response. We need a supportive and safe response. We need long-term mental health services that can offer coping skills, behavior management, social services, supportive housing, educational trades, and employment. When you give people what they need, you are telling them that they matter. We cannot continue to rely on emergency rooms or jails as mental health centers. We are facing a mental health crisis. Mental health is real. I demand that, what we, that we get what we need for our families. And I just wanna say thank you to Jamani for addressing our youth because crime is a cry for help. When someone commits a crime, they're crying for help. And every person who stands before a judge needs to be evaluated. Every person, especially more now than ever. And for telehealth, telehealth, they're- I'm the, Okay. Thank you, I'll send the rest in. Thank you very much. And we'll next turn to Ruth Lowenkron and you can begin as soon as the Sergeant cues you. Time starts now. Thank you, good afternoon. Council members appreciate the opportunity to talk before you. My name is Ruth Lowenkron. I'm the director of the Disability Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. We advocate broadly in the area of disabilities, um, including in, in all realms of mental health issues. Um, but I too am gonna concentrate on what Peggy Herrera so aptly called the crisis of mental health crises. 
and I join my colleagues from the CCITMYC, the Correct Crisis Intervention Today, New York City Coalition, which consists of over 80 organizational members. We're all about transforming what is happening in this city for, to respond to mental health crises. Um, as Chair Lewis mentioned, there's a disproportionate number of black and brown individuals with mental disabilities, so you can only assume that they are disproportionately affected by the response to mental health crisis. And the numbers are not surprisingly reflecting that, but perhaps very surprisingly in how greatly so. As uh, Kim Blair, my colleague said, 18 individuals shot and killed at the hands of the police in the last five years alone, 15 of whom more than 80% are people who are black or brown or other people of color. Unacceptable, it's a crisis, we've got to do something immediately. And what we see around the country is that people are responding, but New York City is not there yet. Even President Obama just tweeted yesterday, you may have seen that, this is what we need to do. We need to make more places do non-police response and get to the help of people who experience mental health crisis. What is the answer? The answer is the proposal that CCITMYC has of removing police entirely, having a community run entity, utilizing peers, those with lived mental health experience and EMTs and responding in equal time to mental health emergencies. What is not the answer? The current iteration of introductory bill 2210. Police have an outsized role, an undefined sense of a public safety emergency, allowing DOHMH to do the work when we are trading off in that regard for another bureaucracy. A 30 minute response time, where does that come from when we have an eight to 10 minute response time for any other emergency? And what else is not the answer? And I'm very disappointed that Susan Herman is not here to hear this, though she has heard it from me many times. The Thrive Pilot is also very much not the answer. It allows for an astronomical 30% of calls to go to the NYPD. All the calls go through 911 which is the NYPD. The, um, they, they insist on utilizing, I'm, I'm just about done, emergency medical technicians who are deeply involved in the problems uh, of the current response. And again, a 30 minute response time, and they'll only operate 16 hours a day as if mental health crises can be timed. So I would cl conclude by saying, especially during this time of COVID, I implore you, implore you, <laughs> excuse me, do not tarry. It's a crisis and I can stand at the ready personally along with my organization, New York Lawyers for the Public Interest and CCITMYC to work with you day and night to make this problem disappear. Please utilize us and let's make this happen together. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll next turn to Felix Guzman. You can begin as soon as the sergeant cues you. Time starts now. Greetings, my name is Felix Guzman. I'm testifying today on behalf of Correct Crisis Intervention Today, a broad coalition of mental health peers, providers, rights activists, advocates, and New Yorkers committed to racial and social justice. We launched CCIT NYC in 2012 with the aim to end the trauma, abuse, injuries, and even violent death that people with mental health needs experience during a moment of crisis. I have lived in Crown Heights my whole life. My path into the mental health and criminal justice system started when I was viciously mugged into unconsciousness at age 14. The resulting trauma, which was never addressed, influenced many of the poor decisions that followed including using drugs and trying to earn money through illegal means. My full story would require over two minutes, two hours to tell, not three minutes, so I will summarize my experience, which is some of it is quite common to many black and brown men. After two convictions for possession, I spent three years in jail, over a year in the shelter system, attempted suicide, and I've been subject to numerous wellness checks by police with riot shields. While what, I was diagnosed with different types of mental illness and put on uh, numerous medications, follow-up care consisted of a referral to Medicaid Mill in downtown Brooklyn, where staff and clients openly exchange drugs. At the same same time, I managed to secure my associate's degree, had a child, and held a full-time job for a human service agency before stress resulted in a, in a nervous breakdown. My life began to change three years ago when I connected with support services following a stay of community accesses 
Peer Staff Respite Center. I became active in the mental health advocacy movement, which has given my life a genuine purpose and helped me to understand more fully my own circumstances. In 2019, I entered Howie the Heart Peer Training Program, which I graduated this month after a year of remote learning, and in 2020, began working full-time for NYC well as a peer support specialist. My future goals include expanding my advocacy activities and finishing college to become a poetry therapist. I believe my life would have been much different if I had been able to connect with counseling services following, following the vicious attack when I was a 14-year-old boy. Instead, the police filed a report and my family sent me back to school the very next day. The city can take some basic steps to lessen the burden of trauma experienced daily by thousands of young people and adults in our black and brown communities. First, the NYPD should not be doing wellness checks that involve mental health issues or or responding to any mental health related 911 calls. If trained peer peer counselors had intervened years ago, my journey would not have been would have been much different. CCIT NYC has developed a peer informed crisis response proposal that should be implemented as soon as possible. Second, police officers often are first responders and they have valuable information about the victims of many violent incidents, including mental health related crisis calls. This information needs to be shared with trained crisis counselors for potential follow up, which could include a phone call from NYC Well to see how the family is doing and to offer ref- referral information. Creating a database like this is, a consi- is consistent with recommendations made to the mayor's office four years ago by the Council of State Governments. Ch- Governance Justice Center. Third, the city needs to engage and support community organizations and other key, key, key other key stakeholders based on the principle of asset-based community development. This approach focuses on community strengths and non-traditional support networks. This idea was proposed to the city in 2018 as the re- recommendations of the Mayor's Task Force on Crisis Prevention and Response. Called Neighborhood Support Networks, it recognized that the knowledge and skills of local groups could be harnessed to support high-risk people that are well-known to residents. The city... I'm going to go ahead and just try to finish up, uh, just be a few seconds. The city cannot form these networks on its own and needs to outsource the organizing effort to a group that has this special skill set and that provides supplemental contracts to the local groups. Finally, building on the first two recommendations, the city should be, should also expand the implementation of community based health organization centers modeled after district health centers from the 1920s. The city's Department of Health in 2017 established three neighborhood health action centers in high need, high need communities to provide place, ser- place based service centers services that respond to the social determinants of health. The action centers provide low-cost office space to co-locate partner organizations, allowing residents to access a broader range of services than the health department could ever offer alone. Thank you for allowing me to share my story. It's important to stress that my experience is not unique. Childhood trauma and its aftermath is directly directly to a range of negative outcomes, including poor educational attainment, higher rates of incarceration, high-risk behavior, depression, anxiety, and early death. The impact of trauma is especially pronounced in low-income black and brown communities. For my family, a phone call to let us know that someone cared and to offer information on how and where to get some help could have made all the difference in the world. I thank you for allowing me to share. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Our next panelist will be Joyce Kendrick. Joyce, you can begin as soon as the sergeant cues you. Time starts now. My name is Joyce Kendrick, and I am the attorney in charge of the mental health representation team of the criminal defense practice at Brooklyn Defender Services. Thank you, Chair Lewis, for holding this important hearing on access to mental health care in communities of color. The mental health representation team at Brooklyn Defender Services works to support people living with serious mental illness who have been accused of a crime in Brooklyn. In response to the question from council member Rosenthal, there are mental health courts in every borough. Every mentally ill client can be referred to mental health court in lieu of having their case proceed on the traditional track. In mental health court, the client is assessed and an individual treatment plan is devised. The goal is that after successful completion of the mandate, the client would have been connected to services in the community and will be able to continue to access treatment and support. I have witnessed amazing outcomes for these clients. That said, the court often mandates mental health care for people who could have avoided the criminal legal system involvement altogether. The city cannot rely on the NYPD and criminal legal system to address mental illness. It is a fact that individuals experiencing a mental health crisis are more likely to be engaged by police than medical providers. This involvement of police too often leads to a disastrous consequences for the person that help was summoned for, particularly for New York New Yorkers of color. Having a mental illness is not a crime and New York City must invest in mental health response teams that de-escalate crisis and prevent people with 
serious mental illness from entering the criminal legal system. We urge the city to invest in free and low cost mental health services that are designed for people who have experienced hardship, trauma, and incarceration. These programs must be equipped to meet the needs of people who are newly in being introduced to mental health care to create a familiar, non-threatening therapeutic environment for those who may be hesitant to engage in treatment. Such programs must employ trained clinicians who are fluent in multiple language. We must, must not place the burden on the patient to educate the clinician about the realities of incarceration, gun violence, or racism. Thank you again for your time. Thank you so much. And our next panelist will be Yao Chong. Yao, you can begin as soon as the sergeant cues you. Time starts now. Sorry about that. Um, hello. Good afternoon, committee chairs on mental health, disabilities, and addiction. My name is Yao Chang, and I am a staff member in the Community Organizing and Public Advocacy Department at the New York City Anti-Violence Project. Our mission is to empower lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and HIV-affected communities and allies to end all forms of violence through community organizing, education, counseling, legal services, and advocacy. Our active membership is predominantly Black and Brown, trans, and gender non-conforming people. I'm here today to assert that the communities that we serve, collaborate, and build relationships with deserve to not just have their immediate needs met, including housing, education, food, shelter, and mental health services, but to thrive. Mental health is crucial for sustainable and overall well-being for Black and Brown communities, which have been historically underserved even prior to the pandemic. As folks have mentioned, the COVID-19 pandemic is causing a mental health crisis. Majority of the services currently available are not culturally competent and unequipped to adequately support black and brown trans and gender non-conforming people who in addition to experiencing the pandemic's consequences including eviction, unemployment, food insecurity, mental distress and more are also facing increased hate violence. Throughout the pandemic, the New York City Anti-Violence Project has continued to provide programming for peer support, our, ser our services mentioned before, including our 24 English and Spanish hotline, 24 hours hotline to black and brown TGNC people. As staff that is fortunate to co-create a space of leadership development and camaraderie with our community members, I've really seen the importance of relationships and services that affirms black and brown TGNC people's identities, experiences, and traumas. However, we are limited in our resources. We know that there's much greater need than supply. Additionally, from my personal experience in psychiatric units due to my own mental health and survivor survivorship from queer intimate partner violence, I have witnessed how the current mental health system enforces, enforces anti-Black racism and ropes patients into costly care that is often more pathologizing than helpful. Therefore, the city needs to prioritize funding adequate mental health resources, services, and infrastructure over policing for our communities. If the needs and experiences of our city's most impacted residents are centered, the city will be stronger and better for all of us. The city can do this by investing in community-based organizations like ours, which has a variety of programs and initiatives that address the root causes of violence against Black and Brown, trans and gender non-conforming people. This includes our hate violence prevention initiative. I believe the city has the power and opportunity to invest in our community's health and safety and emerge from the pandemic with a worthwhile legacy. We call, on the, we call on the city to do so and to ensure that the services provided to our communities are access, accessible and inclusive. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify. Thank you so much. Um, and at this time, I'd like to mention that if we inadvertently missed anyone who wanted to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Um, and I also wanted to remind everyone that you can submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. I'm just gonna pause here to see if we've missed anyone. Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna turn back to Chair Lewis for any closing remarks and to close out the hearing. I just wanna thank everyone for testifying, for sharing their personal testimonies and for all the advocates and CBO leaders that are here today. Um, definitely took some notes got some information and recommendations and we'll definitely uh, include you all in anything that we do moving forward. And with that, I wanna close out this hearing. Thank you so much.